it's difficult with these incarcerated individuals right now um, because of COVID-19, we don't have the same degree of programs available. I know every county has their own approach to what programs would be available to incarcerated individuals. Um, I know that almost all, if not all of the ones here in Lycoming County have been suspended. And I know that um, outside it, people bringing meetings in from the outside, whether they be different recovery programs, it's something I've done for seven years, um, roughly, um, has been halted since last March. So many of these individuals are not having that opportunity to have as many types of programs while they're incarcerated. Um, so what that has led me to do as an attorney and what I advise the other attorneys in my office to do is to really aggressively push to get these individuals bails modified to allow them to get into treatment. The first step I always take in these situations is to contact our SCA and get somebody over there as soon as possible via phone or whatever means possible uh, to assess that individual and find, and then get a recommendation for what level of care, what level of treatment would be appropriate for them and then attempt to modify their bail to facilitate that. Um, those are for the individuals that are incarcerated right off the bat. That's how I try to approach it. Um, you know, with the methamphetamine um, and some to some extent the cocaine use individuals, um, when they're initially incarcerated, depending on their degree and, and how long they've been using, um, it can be, you know, you can, it can be almost what, I don't, I don't know the exact terminology, but they've almost reached a point of psychosis in many, many instances. And it's going to take a little bit before they're even probably ready um, or receptive to treatment that we would try to get for them. Um, other class of individuals would be those who post bail. Um, after being incarcerated, and they can be difficult sometimes in the sense that they don't necessarily have a level of accountability. So these individuals don't have to report to anyone if they're not on probation. Um, they've posted their bail, maybe they're to their bail bondsman, but um, these individuals, you know, in working with them, I tend to tend to make try to do the same suggestions and get them to do it although there's a little bit less incentive on their part uh, because their release isn't necessarily dependent upon it they're already out um, they're not accountable to anyone um, i tend to frame that with them in in the sense that this is something that's only going to benefit you and and for the people that are receptive to treatment they'll usually follow through with whatever i recommend them to do um, and I, and like I said, I usually frame it and this is what's best for your case for you to pursue these. Um, but there are those individuals that, that they're out and they're not necessarily receptive for it. And they just want me to pursue their case. If it's a trial track or suppression motion and just to work on those. And that's what I do. Um, but just with my personal background, I'm always going to have, um, I'm always going to try and nudge them in that direction. Um, even if I don't necessarily divulge my entire story to them. Um, supervised bail program. I don't know to what, how many, if every county in the state has a supervised bail program. We have a very robust one uh, with a very committed administrator of that program. And that oftentimes is one of the best outlets we have because we're able to get these individuals uh, who might not, who are in jail, uh, might not be able to post bail, don't have the means to post bail, um, to get them eligible for our supervised bail program, and then assessed by um, the program administrator and accepted onto it. And then they are released as their case is being processed, but they have an added level of accountability in that they'll be working with a bail agent uh, from, from supervised bail that's going to direct them toward uh, getting assessed a drug assessment, uh, get them directed toward getting into counseling treatment, doing those types of things. All those agents that work in that program in our county are very attuned to treatment, very attuned to um, cognitive behavioral therapy and are able to employ that. I know specific officers there that are really attuned to that. 
Um, so that's a very good program, especially for these individuals once they enter into the criminal justice system before their before trial, before disposition, whatever guilty plea, whatever it is, for them to start entering that treatment, uh, different treatment uh, programs that are available. Um, and then we have the other individuals there. They're not incarcerated. They might be for a lower level offense, a summons issued to them. And I treat those the same as those individuals that were released on the posting of bail where I try to, I, I give them my best advice for them, um, not just so that they don't continue to pick up new criminal charges, but that it may potentially be um, helpful in mitigation if we do try to um, seek a plea deal in their case uh, to enter treatment and to document it and to get involved in as many different treatment modalities as possible. Um, where are they at in the system? Um, well, I would, I'll, I'll jump back again. What, one of the things, you know, and I spoke with our supervised bail administrator about it, one of the differences, and, you know, and that's how I framed everything when I spoke to people and when I was trying to think about this topic, what's the difference here with the psychostimulant user compared to the opioid user? And one of the things that came up a couple of times was, well, in prior with the opioid users, we would we would revert, resort to incarceration at a much greater rate, uh, simply due to the risk of overdose and death. Um, we don't have that same. We don't have the same occurrence of it, frequency of occurrence of overdose with psychostimulants, and we're less inclined to incarcerate as a precautionary measure. Um, we're more inclined to try and keep them involved in treatment. Now, the other thing that he pointed to, though, was, and it's a, probably a theme, you know, it's a theme that'll keep coming up with me, is that at this point in time, uh, methamphetamines are so prevalent on the streets. Um, they're more prevalent than even opioids were at the height of the opioid epidemic, at least in my county. Um, they're so prevalent that the individuals, when they return to their environment, their home, uh, the people still around them are, have so many of them, uh, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, you, they're relatively long lasting. Um, and it's very difficult if we're not incarcerating them, if they're staying out and trying to get them into treatment to fight that other factor of just the sheer availability of methamphetamines at this point. Um, so that's one, that's one of the things that he pointed to as a big problem or as a conundrum that they face. Uh, the other individuals, where else do we see them? Um, so post-sentencing, all right? Um, there's a couple different ways that these things wind up if it's not, the case isn't withdrawn or the, it's a not guilty verdict. Uh, they're going to be sentenced in some fashion, and if they receive, it's either going to be incarceration or probation slash parole um, at the county level. Incarceration, you know, with these individuals, when I have an individual that is, is a really substance use disorder, methamphetamine, uh, cocaine, um, and they maybe they have a heightened prior record score, and it's just not treatment court's not in the cards, you know, and I fought and fought and fought to get treatment court and couldn't get it. Um, if it's not in the cards, it's going to have to be state. What I do in my job is try to get any type of offer that would facilitate the state drug treatment court program, as it is called now, formerly SIP. I don't know all the differences specifically, uh, but I do know what type of sentence I have to get for these guys to get them in the state drug treatment court program or to at least facilitate that. Um, with the county, with the county um, incarceration, one of the things that we try and negotiate is to at least to have them be available for our reentry program that the the county offers. Uh, that's we contract with the third party, uh, geo services. Um, that and I spoke with the facilitator of that program here in our county, and you know his. Obvi almost all the positive urinalyses that he gets nowadays is methamphetamines. Uh, I think that's just due to the prevalence of them. Um, but he 
he really just stressed working the, they have them do groups, working cognitive behavioral therapy with them. You have to change thinking in order to um, get them to change their behaviors, regardless of what the substance is. And, you know, I agree with that. I know that smart recovery, which I'm a facilitator in, it doesn't matter what substance you come in with, uh, they're going to treat it to try to treat the underlying issues the same way, same deal with 12 step programs. Although, you know, there are things now I see popping up like methamphetamine, anonymous cocaine anonymous has been around for a very long time, but it's essentially the same program, the same 12 steps. Um, those, those are how we try to handle them. Um, the probation parole people, they're either going to be on general supervision and oftentimes individuals on general supervision in our county are made to complete that reentry program, which can be about a six month program, um, employing the evidence-based techniques in, in your analyses, testing on a pretty regular basis, or the county treatment courts, which is what I always fight for. It's my, you know, I'm a treatment court graduate myself, so I try to do everything I possibly can to get these individuals onto our county treatment courts because I firmly believe that those offer the best chance of success. Um, and one thing, and in, in we have we have shifted dramatically. We still have a high number of opiate users uh, on our treatment court program, but there is many, many more um, individuals using methamphetamines. Uh, and cocaine on there currently, um, as we see this this shift that's occurred in the last few years. Some of the challenges, I just kind of wrote these down quickly, lack of MAT. And MAT really factors into this. And this is one of the observations that I've made personally, just working with people in recovery. Uh, MAT has been very effective for the opioid use population, opioid use disorder. Um, Unfortunately, for those individuals that don't address maybe some of the underlying issues uh, that still want to get intoxicated in some form or to escape, to do whatever in some form to use, uh, psychostimulants uh, are not impacted by their Suboxone or their Vivitrol or whatever. And it has been, for those individuals, I've seen a lot of people that were formerly opioid users who were on MAT who decided or, or who now relapsing, lapsing, uh, using uh, psychostimulants just because the MAT won't cover it. Um, I know I don't know to what degree any any other presenter in this symposium is going to be working on, uh, you know, or talking about the need for MAT and developing new MAT for um, psychostimulants. Um, but it's a huge one, and it would be a game changer, in my opinion, once we have one that's in, in general use. Um, the availability, like I had mentioned before, these things are just the streets are washed with it. And, um, you know, is, is it necessarily going to be law enforcement and making more arrests? Is that going to cure the problem? I've never necessarily subscribed to that. I've always considered myself a demand side um, individual. And that as long as there's a demand there for uh, people to use a substance, then there's going to be someone to supply it. And, it. and if it's, you know, you arrest and try to get rid of as much of the opiates as possible, something else is going to pop up. I mean, that could very well be an explanation for why the rise in psychostimulants um, has occurred these last couple of years, because so much was put onto Less than a minute, enforcement Matthew. of opioid. Okay. <clears throat> Delivery. And, you know, psychostimulants were a response to that. Um, one thing that kept popping up a lot, less severe physical dependence compared to opiates. Um, that, that's one of some of the CRSs, fellow CRSs I talked to, uh, they don't get, you know, you don't develop the same type of physical uh, dependence and withdrawal as you do with opiates. And so these people, you know, get through a period and are able to, and then say, oh, I'm okay now. And um, it's not as severe and it's not as big a deal. Um, there's some there's some of that sentiment floating around. So that's difficult to combat uh, with this population. Um, the less chance of overdose compared to opiates. That's one that's one thing I mentioned from talking with our uh, supervised bail guy. That just means, in my opinion, we can keep them out and keep them in treatment as much as possible. Uh, generally, less likely to engage in certain types of criminal behavior. I don't necessarily need to touch on that. 
Uh, but that's one of the problems. We don't always have people that are facing as much exposure to help compel them to get into treatment court programs. And then that psycho, you know, that, that state of psychosis following long-term heavy use, uh, that can be difficult. That can just take time. And sometimes that is uh, proper for an individual that needs to be incarcerated for a period of time. So the, the main takeaway I have, though, is um, individuals that are in the criminal justice system present us with a very unique opportunity to incentivize them getting into treatment programs, more so than the individual out on the street in many instances. Um, when somebody is facing a long period of incarceration, that could be the perfect incentive to get them involved in treatment programs. It's not necessarily always going to work, um, but it does many times. And when the individual is ready, is at a point where um, they are ready to start making changes in their lives, um, some of the programs that we can offer in the criminal justice system, like treatment courts, um, you know, our reentry services, GEO, those types of things, um, can perfectly help assist them on their journey. Um, so with that, that's everything I would have. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we're going to go ahead to uh, and start with, I'm sorry, April, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is April Villa Barclay. I'm the Chief Probation Officer in York County, where I oversee adult probation, juvenile probation, and our pretrial services. I've worked in probation for about 19 years, very involved in our problem-solving courts here in York. And prior to that, I worked for six years in the mental health system, um, primarily working with the homeless mentally ill. Um, so I have a bit of a broad background on these topics. So I just included my contact information if anybody wants to reach out after this presentation. Um, so nationally about 60 to 70 percent of individuals involved in the criminal justice system struggle with addiction or mental illness. And I do suspect that that is much higher in York. Unfortunately with the way our data case management system collects data, we're unable to pull more specific information out to get a more accurate representation of that. Also with the confidentiality barriers with um, drug and alcohol information, sometimes it's difficult for us to get information about someone's history with drug and alcohol treatment. So we sometimes rely on self-report and sometimes individuals being placed on probation don't necessarily want to share that they're um, using, that they have a history of substance abuse just because of their fear of going to jail. Um, and also with um, our coroner has been tracking statistics related to overdose deaths and with the at the height of the heroin epidemic York County was one of the highest in the state. Those numbers had gradually come down over the last couple years and then unfortunately this year with COVID there has been a dramatic increase in those deaths um, which is unfortunate. The um, survey thing is on top of the, the uh, arrows for me to click through the slides. Ah, thank you. Okay, so what are we seeing in York? Um, York County had traditionally been very high with, um, I would say about 50-50 with crack cocaine and heroin. Um, this was traditionally what we dealt with here in York. Then, of course, with the heroin epidemic, the use of heroin in the county skyrocketed. We saw the increase in overdose deaths. More recently, though, within the last year, we have definitely seen a huge increase in both uh, molly and meth. Um, we have a lot of individuals reporting daily usage of those. Um, and what they're telling us is that they're viewing the use of molly and meth as being safer than heroin because of the fear of dying and also because they can use, if they're on an MAT, they can use molly and meth and still get high. Um, so that's what we're kind of seeing here. And again, the increased death just recently. Um, this next slide is actually 
I've had a partnership with our coroner's office where we get emails when there is a suspected overdose death. Then I cross check it in our case management system to see kind of what is the crossover. And I know this slide is it's a little confusing. But so far of the deaths that have occurred in York County since the January 1 till the end of October, 36% of those individuals were on supervision with us at the time of their death. Another 35% of them had been on probation at some point, which is a total of about 71% had some history with adult probation. If we dived into that further, about 18% of them had been on previously on juvenile supervision. 6% of them were, had just been released from the jail, the our county jail in the last seven days, and 3% of them had been released from the jail in the last 28 days. And 60% of them had been in jail at some point. So what this shows us is that there is a huge crossover with um, addiction and the criminal justice system and the kind of the consequences of that addiction. I really think this is something that we should spend more time kind of studying why this is. Is this just, um, why is this? Because you could draw a lot of conclusions from this information. Um, so I really think it is worth kind of diving in and studying. So one of the things that we've done is recently is partnering with our local law enforcement to get information on who is overdosing in the community. Um, as someone is, as the police are having interactions with individuals and responding to calls about overdoses, um, the information kind of goes into a vacuum. It goes into, they enter it into JNET, into ODIN, um, but we don't really get that information. And we don't really, I can, I can, I'm sure you can imagine that sometimes individuals on supervision aren't necessarily um, calling in right away to let their probation officer know because of their fear of going to jail, their fear of the consequences of that use. So we've had this partnership primarily with the city where the majority of the overdoses happen and I have been able to get it from some of the surrounding police departments where individuals who are overdosing that they're responding to, they're reporting that information to us. So of that information that we're receiving, 33% of those individuals were active on active supervision at the time of the overdose. 60% had some involvement, current or prior. 51% had been in jail at some point, and 19% had had prior involvement in the juvenile system. So what do we do with this information? Our office in York, we've really been moving more towards, let's get individuals into treatment because jail isn't really the best place for someone to get treatment. It's not necessarily a safe environment for people to engage and be honest and open with treatment. So our in initiative or our push over the last six, seven years has been to really get people into treatment. So we make decisions on a daily basis when someone is using or relapsing about what is the best course of action? Is it jail? Is it not jail? Um, and I would agree with Matthew that, you know, with heroin, the probation officers really did think more about putting people in jail for fear of those individuals dying, um, whereas with meth, it's not as much of an issue. But our goal is definitely to divert people into treatment. So some of the things that we are doing here in York is that I have five level of care assessors on staff. They are probation officers slash level of care assessors. Three of them are stationed at our prison. Um, two of them are assessing people in pretrial status and one of them is assessing individuals who um, are in on violations related to drug and alcohol use. So we assess those individuals um, to divert them into treatment. And just like Matthew and Lycoming County, we have a very active pretrial program here in York and had, had pushed about six years ago, we received a grant from PCCD where I obtained one of these level of care assessors position is to assess individuals from the time they hit the jail to see what their needs are. Um, if they've received a monetary bail of some sort, could we assess them 
get them out into treatment on the into the community. And it's been very successful. Um, so as soon as the person hits the jail, we're assessing them to see if they're eligible for pretrial status. Our level of care assessor assesses their treatment needs. Um, looking into what the level, appropriate level of care is. Then we notify the defense attorney and the DA about the cases. They assess them, then they go back before, if all parties are in agreement, they go back before the judge and we're getting them released on supervised bail to engage them in treatment. Um, I also have a level of care assessor that is assessing individuals in pretrial status that are in the community. And then of course our individual who is, um, for the individuals pending, probation or parole violations, she's assessing them to see if we can get them out into treatment as well. Um, we also developed um, with the heroin, at the height of the heroin overdose deaths, we developed a heroin protocol that we give to our officers to really kind of help them walk through the process of what they should be doing and how they should be helping individuals kind of access services, um, whether we should be incarcerating or not diverting into treatment, helping them get into detox, and hooking them up with case management services. Because again, our goal is not to incarcerate our way out of this, this um, epidemic, as everyone knows. So some of our newer initi initiatives that I'm super excited about um, is our criminal justice advisory board has been actively working to expand, expand our diversionary options. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the sequential intercept model. The sequential intercept model is a model that lays out the criminal justice system with five intercept points where you can divert individuals from the criminal justice system into treatment. The earlier we divert, what we see is that individuals, the closer to arrest that you divert someone, the more likely that individual is to engage in treatment and the more money you save across the criminal justice system. So obviously the earlier we divert, the better it is for everyone. So we're um, developing, our district attorney here in New York is very active in piloting some programs for pre-arrest diversion. We also are looking at, we have a, um, I think this is one of the things that's unique about York is uh, several years ago we developed pre-trial diversionary matrix that individuals that are placed on pretrial supervision that engage in treatment and do well, we submit a report to the court and recommending that they get an incentive. And that incentive could be half the recommended sentence um, or less jail time, more time on um, some sort of monitor in the community rather than jail. Um, it's been successful um, and we're obviously getting more people into treatment. Um, another major initiative that we have going on is Community Action for Recovery and Diversion. This was really kind of spearheaded by Judge Craig Trebilcock here in York County. He is the um, Veterans Court judge and oversaw our heroin court and really saw the benefits of the wellness courts and how they were able to help individuals into treatment as opposed to the regular criminal justice system where he saw a large part of his docket individuals struggling with addiction and mental illness coming before him. So we really wanted to look at, well, what can we do on a larger scale to offer more options to people, not just the wellness courts? Because if you're familiar with the wellness court research, what it tells us is that that population, those that are appropriate for wellness courts are high risk, high needs individuals. So what, how do we help the rest of the individuals that are struggling with addiction but are not necessarily high risk? So CARD has been working to kind of, you know, break down the barriers between the uh, criminal justice, the behavioral health, um, and the medical health communities to see how we can wrap services around individuals. And a latest partnership out of that has been with Wellspan Health, who is bringing a certified community behavioral health center here to York County, which can be a really a one-stop shop for individuals that are struggling with addiction. And they're partnering with us, and I will actually have probation staff there um, from our pretrial officer all the way up to regular probation officers and our level of care assessors to kind of be a part of that. Um, and it's a, it's kind of a 
we're a little incubator for kind of how we can expand that across the criminal justice system. Um, one part of that will be it's a place for law enforcement to, if they run into someone that's struggling with addiction in the community, they can transport them right to the CCBHC where level of care assessors will be available on site to help them to engage those people right then and there in treatment. Um, so lots of exciting things coming in York um, through our pre-trial um, efforts, through our CARD initiative. Thank you so much, and April. I that's all I we'll have. Go on while to I have a slide that says questions, I Judge guess. Judge Eleni Geishauer. You may be muted, Judge Geisha. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'll repeat myself. Uh, I'm Judge Geishauser. I am a common pleas judge in Berks County, Pennsylvania. I preside over um, all the DUIs in Berks County, which amount to be about 1,500 cases, as well as treatment court, which is DUI treatment court for me. Our county actually has four treatment courts. We have a mental health treatment court, a drug treatment court, DUI treatment court, and a veterans treatment court. So uh, we have a really robust system here that I think we are all really proud of. Uh, I'm gonna just outline a little bit about what we do in DUI treatment court. When I first came, just to give you a, a frame of reference for the last four years, uh, I would say the majority of the cases were alcohol. So I think that people have a misconception that a driving under the influence offense means alcohol. It does not. It is any alcohol or controlled substance. Um, even legal prescription controlled substances can qualify as a, a driving under the influence offense depending on the facts. So um, what I have seen in the last five years is a market increase uh, from strictly alcohol driving under the influence offenses to a balance of controlled substances, including meth, which for us in Berks County is on the rise, uh, to the point where currently my court has about 36% of the individuals who are currently engaged in treatment court are controlled substances versus alcohol. So DUI treatment court is a diversionary program. It is for multiple offenders. So if you have a second or third offense DUI, uh, you can apply for treatment court. The fourth offense can be waived. And for a frame of reference, uh, a second offense DUI could carry a 90-day minimum uh, sentence in jail. A third and subsequent offense could uh, carry a one year or more, but a mandatory one year. So what this program allows individuals to do is um, essentially reduce the rate that they're incarcerated and then we try to address all of their needs. So unique to Berks County is the fact that our treatment court does not just address high risk, high need individuals. We implement an assessment tool called the DUI RANT, the risk and needs assessment. And what we do then is classify individuals based on both their RANT and their CRN evaluation into a category of high risk, high need, high risk, low need, low risk, high need. And each of those tracks, if you will, have different reporting requirements because as we know from the research, uh, you do not want to over-program someone and you do not want to under-program. So this is our best attempt based on uh, proven tools to place an individual, a participant, in the correct track and meet those needs without over-meeting or under-meeting. So what's required is um, an application. That application is filed uh, through the court and it is assessed by my team, which is made up of myself, a member of law enforcement, members of probation, 
uh, who supervise our participants, members of treatment uh, who have been integral in making recommendations throughout the process. We have a member from TASC, which is um, kind of our county testing agent. Uh, we also have members of pretrial services, and we have a partnership in Berks County with the YMCA, which is right across the street from the courthouse. So we have a six-month case management included program at the YMCA for some of our participants. So a, an individual uh, from the YMCA sits on our team, as well as members of the district attorney's office and the public defender's office to represent those aspects of the, the case. So we evaluate each participant based on their application. Uh, I will tell you that I am fairly generous in allowing people to be admitted to DUI treatment court. Uh, we were trained to not shy away from the hard cases. So we have even begun in the right situations to allow individuals who have a possession with intent to delivers in their criminal backgrounds to participate in treatment court, uh, which is something kind of new and which has developed uh, as I've gone to different state trial judge conferences and, and we as judges have discussed the population and what we're hoping to do. So um, the program is made up of those tiers. What they, the key components of the program are essentially a non-adversarial team approach, which is the team that we just discussed, an intensive post-conviction court supervision, reliable evaluation and a treatment plan, frequent drug and alcohol testing, accountability, and immediate incentives and sanctions. So to just give a little bit of an, an overview, um, the program is 18 months. During that 18 month period, there are three phases in DUI treatment court. And each phase has different goals and different requirements. The first phase is really about stabilization. Um, what we do is we get them involved in their testing, we get the treatment started, we get them uh, kind of going, organized. It's a, a phase of great organization. The second phase, we delve a little bit deeper into criminogenic needs and uh, also those things that are the catalysts for their use. Uh, we see an enormous amount of abuse. Um, an interesting side note, my team went to a training in Washington, D.C. for the National Association of, of Drug Court Professionals, and one of the things that we implement, implemented in 2016 was a, a separation of our males and females so that the women had a separate treatment court meeting from the men. And I will tell you that that was profound. The effect of it was profound because what we learned was a lot of the underlying causes for both populations, not just the women, um, really rooted in abuse. And neither population was very comfortable in sharing that with the opposite sex present. It's, it was that simple. And so that had a revolutionary effect on what those um, court sessions looked like. So um, they report to me every other week if they are a track one. Some individuals report once a month, some individuals report once a quarter based on the tier that they have been placed in. Uh, we track their treatment. They have to engage in three recovery related events each week uh, that can include treatment. Uh, some of the recovery related events that I think are unique to Berks County, we actually have a fitness program called Motive Fitness. We have a master garden program. We teamed with Penn State Master Gardeners. There is a sufficient amount of research that uh, establishes recovery gardens are wonderful therapeutic tools for individuals in recovery. So we have partnered with Penn State Master Gardeners and in the spring, they have an educational piece with each session. They, have op they offer two different uh, times a week and then you go, you have the educational piece, they choose what they're going to plant. We have 10 plots at uh, a place called Opportunity House our participants plant it, they um, weed it, they harvest it, and all the while they, they learn container gardening, all kinds of wonderful things. But they also 
make friends, friends who are also in recovery, which is a, a huge uh, thrust of ours. Our, our Penn State Master Gardener program recently won a, an award, the David Gibby Search for Excellence Award, so that was very exciting for us to learn. And we also are working on a um, a nutrition program that will be an extension of the Motive Fitness program. The Motive Fitness program has yoga, a walk run where our participants actually then participate as a group in a 5K run or walk. It also has a spin class. Um, we kind of uh, and a CrossFit. So um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that those types of pro-social activities, recovery-related events, uh, are are a wonderful thing and and. Uh, contribute to successful recovery and so we've been able to implement those programs. Uh, they have to call for their urine analysis every day so that um, they can submit to testing if that is the day that, that they are called because it's random urine analysis testing. Um, so those are the major parts of it. We also have a, a cognitive behavioral group. Uh, statutorily for a driving under the influence offense all offenders must complete what is called alcohol safe driving. Berks County ha developed and then um, had it approved by the state for multiple offenders. We call it advanced alcohol safe driving. It is actually a 12 week cognitive behavioral therapy program. Uh, so it seemed silly to me when I came in here that an individual who is a third offender would go through the same program three times because it's statutorily required. Shouldn't we be giving them something new, something different, something that might, you know, uh, offer a light bulb moment and help them for their long-term recovery? So we developed this program and, and honestly it's been really successful. Uh, I did mention the YMCA to you. Uh, like I said, there's a six-month program at the YMCA. It was developed with the uh, help of COCA, and um, our participants have case management. They live there. They have um, AA meetings or recovery-related meetings that are right there in the YMCA, and then they have access to all of our other programs because Motive is out of the YMCA. The yoga was out of the YMCA. Uh, they have their floor meetings, um, chores, all of those kinds of things. They essentially live as a recovery community with full-time staff there to monitor them and help guide their progress. Uh, we have uh, been working to actually renovate that floor and really just upgrade our, our services for our participants. Um, and so that's a, another project that we're really excited about. In terms of sentencing, these individuals come to court. It's a diversionary program. So if you're a second offender DUI, instead of doing 90 days, you do four days. And the balance of that 90 days, which are required by law, uh, are done on an electronic monitor. For a third and subsequent offense, the individual would uh, be incarcerated for six days and then the balance of that year would be again on electronic monitoring. We have been able to, uh, through grant funding, pay for that electronic monitoring for our participants as well as uh, have a reduced cost for their urine, urine analysis. They pay, uh, I believe, one or two dollars per test versus the eight dollar test that it would be, and in some cases, depending on the substances, which are the participants' uh, drugs of choice, they, those testing costs can go up. So that's the sentencing um, portion, and then throughout the court proceedings, we essentially, as I mentioned, have incentives and sanctions. So the incentives, every week that they um, participate and are doing well, haven't missed anything, have no positive urine analysis, um, and are essentially doing what they're supposed to be doing, then we have a, a bowl of incentives, which could include an early dismissal from court. It can include, I have thoughtful cards that we have purchased from Barnes & Noble that really just give a reflection um, that they have to read out loud to, to everyone. We have treats, we have recovery pens, we have recovery calendars, just a bunch of different things that we can uh, offer a participant as continued incentive to do well. And then in terms of sanctioning, 
Uh, sanctioning can be anything from an essay up and through incarceration. Incarceration is our last resort. Uh, it is not something that most of our participants shy away from. Uh, many of them are very familiar with incarceration and pretty much can do a day, 24 hours or 48 hours, you know, without blinking an eye. So we really look to give them the uncomfortable things, you know, working on the underlying issues and uh, addressing what is driving the behaviors. So um, it's funny, some people would actually rather go to jail and have asked